uh, welcome uh, once again in this uh, series of uh, 1888 it is uh, diagnosis analysis and uh, solution and this is uh, part E where we are looking at uh, the message and uh, it is uh, opposition shall we uh, pray even as we go on uh, with uh, where we left uh, in uh, our previous uh, uh, presentation shall we pray heavenly father thank you once again for an opportunity to study your word we really thank you for even the nice weather that uh, you have given unto us and uh, not only the nice physical weather, but uh, even the spiritual realm that uh, you are ministering to your children in such hours as this. And so may the heavenly current flow in my lips and my whole being so that uh, I may represent heaven in a rightful way through thy son, Jesus Christ, I pray these things. Amen. And uh, so we continue with the history of uh, Minneapolis. And uh, I believe that the Lord will want us to learn and unlearn many of the things that uh, uh, we hold unto. And uh, understand the kind of spirit uh, that uh, has led us in the past and uh, how he will want us to walk and work in a time that you're living in, in connection with the third angel's message and uh, uh, in connection with the messages that uh, he's giving the people. We left it at this point, those uh, whom uh, are continuing in the series, and if you haven't watched the others so that uh, the other presentation so that you may understand where we are coming from and going you may revisit them on uh, our youtube channel uh, and be able to learn or uh, my facebook uh, timeline or our group uh, facebook uh, group we left it uh, at this point it's a deplorable fact that men have connected uh, with uh, men looked up to them and placed them where God should be, regarded their words uh, and works as inspired, their interpretation of scripture inspired, and they have become copies of them. They are dwarfed in their religious experience. They do not lead out. They are letting other men be brains for them, letting another man search the scriptures for them, and accepting his decisions as authority. And yet that man whom they depend on and trust in is compassed with the same human infirmities and weakness. And uh, his defects really are regarded to be virtues to be copied. The Lord wants ministers of the gospel to search the scriptures. Make no living man a channel. Accept that not the work he does as without a flaw. Do not let him do the work god has told you to do if you do how are you occupying a safe position jesus bids you come to him the greater teacher and learn of him and you should find rest to your souls let no man stand between your soul and jesus christ thinking that uh, the lord tells him that which he refuses to tell you give god a chance Ministering brethren to operate on your mind. Place yourself before him as one who wants to learn of him. You must uh, place yourself before the Lord in diligently searching his word that he may communicate ideas to you. He does not design that you shall be dependent on human minds. He will have you look to him in faith to do like things for you, not through another man but to you. And this is the place we left that uh, the problem uh, that uh, 
arose in Minneapolis 1888 is man looking unto man and not uh, relying on God. And so when the message came in, uh, it was so difficult uh, uh, for the people to comprehend at that time. And so now we pick it from there and continue with the history of Minneapolis 1888. It is diagnosis, analysis, and solution. And this time we are looking at the message and uh, it is continual uh, uh, opposition. The prophetess says in uh, page uh, 841, paragraph 2, I say, through the word given me of God, those who have stood so firmly to defend their ideas and position on the law in Galatians have need to search their hearts as with a lighted candle to see what manner of spirit has actuated them. With Paul, I will say, who hath uh, bewitched you that you, obey, you should not obey the truth, Galatians 3.1. What satanic persistency and obstinacy has been evidenced? I have had no anxiety about the law in Galatians, but I have had anxiety that our leading brethren should not go over the same ground of resistance to light and the manifest and uh, the manifest testimonies of the Spirit of God, and reject everything to idolize their own supposed ideas and faith theories. I am forced by the attitude my brethren have taken and the spirit evidence to say, God deliver me from your ideas of the law in Galatians. If the receiving of these ideas will make me so unchristian in my spirit, words and works as many who ought to know better uh, have been. I see not the divine credentials accompanying you. I am warned again and again of what we will be the result of this warfare you have persistently maintained against the truth. Now, in the book of John 17, 17 says that uh, sanctify them with the truth, thy word is truth. And uh, the prophet says that uh, if the ideas you have on the law of Galatians will make me such an a Christian, then uh, I have no part in that. The positions we take in our beliefs the ideas that we have and the theories we have, if they make us so unchristlike and turn us cold and into Laodicean state, if what we believe will move us from Philadelphian, that is brotherly love, to Laodicean, then it is a time we thought about those ideas once again because the truth have to have an accompany of a sanctifying influence and power to make people have the fruits of the spirit and not the contrary. But if our ideas, if our theories, if what we believe us will make people think that we are infidels or will make our behavior be as infidels, then uh, we have to think about the spirit attending to the message itself. It is okay to have doctrines. It is good to have beliefs and theories. But if uh, the doctrines that we have are not accompanied by the spirit of the doctrine of truth that brings in, uh, uh, the brotherly love, then uh, we may really uh, uh, again rethink of uh, the manner uh, of uh, the things that uh, we believe in. Continued on, and uh, we are not far from those who are coming in. We are just starting. There was a little delay. We were in the Sabbath school, and it delayed a little bit. Many commit the error of trying to define minutely the fine points of distinction between justification and sanctification. Now, this quote, I have read it over and over again, and uh, let me say, I have... Uh, seen and experienced the uh, brethren split over these minute uh, definitions of words, justification and sanctification, glorification, and not only in the doctrine of justification by faith, but even in other doctrines, the people try to come so minutely to uh, definition of terms until you find that this division and fights and splits over semantics and words when actually somebody is speaking the same thing from a different angle, but because brethren feel that it is a threat to what they believe, 
they reject the whole thing and uh, they say if this is what uh, you believe and this is what you are saying then we have none of it and you are not part of us and so don't think that this is something new that is happening amongst us but uh, this is the spirit of Minneapolis 1888 and uh, there was a lot of semantics on words and uh, Smith wanting uh, Wagoner to say exactly what he was saying and Jonas to speak exactly what uh, 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 the brethren uh, were speaking but uh, again the prophet comes in to warn that which was happening in 1888. Many commit the error of trying to define minutely the fine points of distinction between justification and sanctification. Into the definition of these two terms, they often bring their own ideas and speculations. Why try to be more minute than is inspiration on the vital question of righteousness by faith? Now, the define minutely, uh, trying to define minutely the fine points of distinction between justification and sanctification really obscures, the prophet says, the question uh, uh, of righteousness by faith. It confuses the people in that uh, it uh, brings us to a position we define things the way we want them to fit in uh, 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 our views. So why try to work out every minute point as if the salvation of the soul depended upon all having exactly your understanding of this matter? And this is what I'm speaking about. Sometimes we can be disagreeing, but it is on semantics. It is not in the real gist and meat of the issue which brings about the issue of righteousness by faith or any other doctrine that we are speaking about. You, you, you may see people differing in semantics, but I'll rather see the experience of the message being more the prominent matter. I, what am, am I trying to say? Because uh, sometimes I lack the language when I'm dealing with some things. Take an example. Uh, you see people are holding tenaciously on some doctrines, but then you look at uh, the, the experience of the message itself. The person is holding on to, yes, it is true that uh, God is one, and there is his son, and there is the spirit. But then you find a person so abusive, the language that is used doesn't accompany the experience of having the one true God, Jesus Christ, and their spirit. And then you find that uh, somebody is holding on to this minute definitions of uh, justification, sanctification, and glorification. But uh, you look at uh, how their lives have been changed with this defined, minute definitions of this doctrine, their healthy living, their dress reformation, and all this. And then all of a sudden, it comes to, it doesn't matter, but I'm holding otherwise to the right doctrine. And so there have been a lack of experience of the doctrines we espouse and we minutely define. There has been a lack of experience in them. Yet we hold on to this uh, minute definition so tenaciously that if anyone would come with um, something that seems so different from our definition of that, then that person right away is a heretic. But Again, if we look at the way we treat that person then, from then, that point on then, you find that uh, there is no Christ-like spirit. And so it narrows down to, what is the experience accompanying your minute definitions of these things? And this is what is going on in Minneapolis. The people say that they believe in righteousness by faith, justification by faith. They believe in the seventh day Adventism. They believe in the law. They believe in the gospel. But look at how their minute definition of these things, they are treating Elder Wagoner, Elder Jones, Willie White, and Sister White. There is no Christ-like spirit accompanying the doctrine themselves. I, I hope that uh, we understand what I'm saying. 
I feel my spirit stirred within me. I feel to the depth of my being that the truth must be born to other countries and nations and to all classes. Let the missionaries of the cross proclaim that there is one God and one mediator between God and man who is Jesus Christ, the son of the infinite God. Now you find the message of one true God also is coming in in 1888 materials. But you, you, you wonder how is this issue of uh, the law in Galatians Righteousness by faith, justification by faith, the third angel's message in verity, and then she mentioned the, the image of the beast in uh, Revelation chapter 13, that uh, any opposition to the truth and light and the way we treat other brethren may be making us align with the beast of Revelation chapter 13. And now uh, we have just read about the message of the one true God. And all this is a package of the third angel's message in verity, which is justification by faith. But how are all these things connected? Uh, I continue reading uh, what we are reading, that uh, let the missionaries of the cross proclaim that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, who is Jesus Christ, the son of infinite God. But uh, the issue of one God and the mediator Jesus Christ, the whole essence of that message is uh, to show victory over sin, that uh, you believe that there is one God, and there is the mediator, and that mediator is giving you his righteousness so that you may love your neighbor as you love yourself, and you will do unto others what you will want others to do unto you. And this is the whole uh, aspect of righteousness by faith, which is letting Christ in so that you may not only keep the commandments legally, but you may also give, keep them spiritually. And we, we try to say this, and uh, uh, this is what I'm all trying to say. Take an example on how Christ expands righteousness in uh, the book of Matthew chapter 5. You have heard it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say if somebody looks at a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery. You have said that you shall not, you have heard that it has been said you shall not murder, you shall not commit murder. But I say unto you, whoever hates his brother, he has committed murder. And you have heard that you shall not hate your brother. But whoever says to your brother, Raka, you vain thing, uh, he has committed all this sin. And so, when you look at the broader aspect of uh, righteousness by faith in connection with the third angel's message, keeping the law, and then uh, one true God message, it is recognizing Jesus Christ as the mediator of the covenant and what effect does that have in your life that it will bring you into a position you look at his divine credential and attributes and partake the same spirit of the mediator of the covenant but if in the belief of your doctrine and the third angel's message which is righteousness by faith and justification by faith you will have satanic attributes then the theory of that message is nothing but a false understanding of justification by faith. We don't go so deep into that message and what is happening in Minneapolis. But as more as I study this message at different angles and pray the Lord to reveal to me the same spirit that was in Minneapolis, if it is happening in my life personally, I find that... Uh, Previously, I have incli been inclined to the brethren who are opposing the message than to the brethren who are accepting it. Theoretically, I'm on the side of Wagona, Jonas, Sister White, and Willie White. But practically, I'm finding myself leaning on the side of Uriah Smith, G.I. Butler, Elder Kilgo, Elder Morrison, Elder Dan Jonas. And... 
not only in the message of justification by faith, but in other doctrines, because I'm looking at the thing in a holistic manner. That brethren, every day I'm reviewing and trying to understand. Is it just the theory of the message, which is not accompanied by the spirit of the message? Is it just an intellectual accent to the truth or there is something more than that that should be accompanying it? And how has been my life? How has been your life? And so as you read, many people say that I do understand the message of 1888. And uh, as I said previously, people wonder, how is it that the brethren rejected the message? The issue is not per se rejecting the message and being opposition to it. The issue is lacking experience in the messages themselves and so that when a message comes to us instead of dealing it with it the way Christ could have dealt with it we find ourselves employing human power so that we seem so much defending what we believe than how Christ would act in that instance. I, I hope that is clear at that point and uh, I'll give a uh, a chance in the end for people to react to that. So, let the missionaries of the cross proclaim that there is one God and one mediator between God and man who is Jesus Christ, the Son of infinite God. Then she continues, this needs to be proclaimed throughout every church in our land. But look at the statement that follows. Christians need to know this and not to put man where God should be. So now the issue changes to proclaiming the message to experiencing the message because we can proclaim the message and just put ourselves where God should be. Christians need to know this and not to put man where God should be that they may no longer be worshippers of idols but of the living God. Idolatry exists in our churches. Means had better be employed to save souls from death which would be placing jewels in the crown of Jesus Christ and stars in our crowns in the kingdom of heaven. Continued on. And look at the spirit of the message itself. She, she's going beyond this theory of believing in justification by faith, righteousness by faith, the third angel's message. And she goes to the spirit behind it. What we want is the spirit of Jesus. What we want is not a theory of this truth and intellectual accent to this message because we will find ourselves persecuting our own brethren, thinking that uh, we now have a, de a minute definition of things, but yet lacking the spirit that attends to that message. Here are the credentials that we are to bear. By this shall all men know that uh, you are my disciples. And what? If you have love one to another. If you become Philadelphia, then people will start recognizing that you are my disciples. She says, we need to pray more and we have, and, and when we have Christ abiding in the soul, his spirit in me will harmonize with his spirit in you. And he who controls our minds controls also the heavenly intelligences and they cooperate with us. Then in every council you will have the presence of one mighty in council. Jesus will be there. There will be no contention, no strife, no stirring up of the worst passions of the heart. What we want is to find refuge in Jesus. What we want is to be converted. And how and oh how I have longed for the converting power of God to go through assembly. And so when we come to the point that uh, we shall say we are understanding justification by faith or the third angel's message in verity, then she goes ahead to say that uh, in our councils, the spirit of God in you and the spirit of God in me will harmonize and then there shall be no strife. They, our minds shall be controlled there shall not be contention and the stirring up of the worst passions of the heart. Now, 
as I go through this history, the question that uh, I'm asking myself and the question that you should be asking yourself, is the Spirit of God in somebody harmonizing with the Spirit of God in you? And uh, are you still contentious? Are you still the kind of person that is stirring up worst passions in the people? Are you that person that uh, actually uh, is bringing uh, uh, strife in the councils or in the meetings that uh, are there? These questions leads us to examine ourselves more than we examine others and scrutinize others. It leads to self-examination. But uh, what has been lacking in us is self-examination. We see other people who have, us, have gone uh, on the other tangent and uh, crossed the barriers more than uh, we ourselves. We like uh, to think of ourselves more than uh, the Lord looks at us. The prophetess continues, uh, and she says, I fear that some will never be converted, not because God is not willing to convert them, but because they have eyes and yet see not, ears have they, but they hear, hear not. They have understanding and yet understand not. They are too proud to acknowledge their errors and in contrition of heart seek God in repentance. Now, shall we put away this impenitent spirit? Shall we fall on the rock and be broken? Jesus is soon coming in the clouds of heaven. What is he doing now? He is testing a people here upon the earth to see if they can live in harmony without revolt in heaven. Now, I want you to mark that statement very well that he is testing a people here upon the earth to see if they can live in harmony without a revolt in heaven. Now, if our meetings are filled so much with revolution, what do you think will happen if uh, the two, uh, these two groups that are at revolt together find themselves in heaven? You know, sometimes we say that, uh, okay, as we stand in, uh, in point of time, okay, you go seek your God, and I go seek my God, and uh, let us meet in heaven. We bid each other Godspeed and fare thee well, and we are bidding them fare thee well and Godspeed on the earth, we can uh, persist together and let them have their work. Let me have my work. But uh, the final product, let us meet in heaven and we will coexist. Now, on earth we can't coexist, but we are bidding each other fare the well and let us meet in heaven. You see how hypocritical this can get to? And at the same time say that, uh, we are preaching the third angel's message in verity, justification by faith. When God is testing our people, if they, he can see if they can live in harmony here on earth or if they will cause another revolt in heaven. Now, by inspiration and scripture, I can tell you that if that is the way we have been conducting things, bidding others fare the well, we cannot harmonize and live together and then tell them that let us meet in heaven we are braced and preparing for another revolution in heaven, which shall not be there. Sin, now one nine says that sin, what you have thought about God, rebellion shall not rise again. And so if the Bible be true and every man a liar, then the fair conclusion is this, that we can end up in heaven. Because if we can live in harmony here, what we are preparing for is another revolution in heaven and that there will be no other revolution. So let the Bible remain true and every man a liar that all of us are preparing not to go to heaven. That is a bold statement that we have to think about. Continued on. 
in this hour, uh, in this hour, um, in this our day, men have placed themselves where they are wholly unable to fulfill the conditions of repentance and confession. Therefore, they cannot find mercy and pardon. The sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit does not lie in a sudden word or deed. It is a the firm, determined resistance of truth and evidence. Now, pause there a minute. We, we like speaking about Revelation chapter 13 and uh, the man of sin and blasphemy. That uh, it is uh, where a man calls himself God when he is not God, when he is man. And uh, when a man uh, says that uh, he can forgive sin when that is a prerogative of uh, the attribute of God. And we talk about this as blasphemy uh, and uh, against the Holy Ghost and so forth. But now you find that uh, blasphemy goes more deeper than that that it is the firm determined resistance of truth and evidence. And so what you find that is happening in Minneapolis 1888 is total blasphemy. Now, if you will tell a Seventh-day Adventist that uh, you are committing blasphemy, they'll uh, immediately respond to you that uh, I'm not a poor, neither do I belong to a papal system. That, that is what comes out of our mind uh, immediately. But then you ask them, do you know that uh, the sin of blasphemy is uh, rejecting the truth and being in opposition to something that you don't understand when it's brought unto you in a light that is different from the way you have perceived it and men will look at you as if you are out of your mind. But then that is blasphemy and that is what the prophet says. And many a times, day in, day out, many people have committed the sin of of blasphemy, where they have been brought into a place they can repent, they can uh, take a low position and uh, think over the matter, but uh, they will uh, come into opposition with everything that is presented without even looking unto it, because they have placed man where God should be. They have taken the prerogatives of the Holy Spirit to say that which is truth and that which is error. Time is short. The first, second, and third angels' message are the messages to be given to the world. We hear not literally the voice of the three angels, but these angels in Revelation represent a people who will be upon the earth and give the message. And so the review and herald office is not a right position, is not in a right position before God. Why? The Lord requires that everyone of his servant do his bidding, but there is a great neglect of this. The atmosphere in the review office is not healthful. The managers are not fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. While um, they profess to believe the Bible, they fail in practicing its teachings. So there is a profession of the Bible. There is a profession going on. And even you understand James says that uh, thou believeth that there is one true God, the devil believes that and trembles. And so he says that, Show me your faith and I show you my works. And so faith without works is uh, something that uh, is uh, abhorrent to God. If we say we believe something and then the manifestation of our works is contrary to the message itself, then we are just like the devil who believes that there is one God and trembles at it, but the character of the devil remains the character of the devil. And so... The atmosphere in the review office is not healthful. The managers are not fervent in spirit serving the Lord. While they profess to believe the Bible, they fail in practicing its teachings. They are hearers but not doers of the word. The heavenly graces are not in the heart and woven into the character. The requirement is seek ye the ki first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, 33. The truth as it is in Jesus will lead men to make Christ first and the world second. They will not engage in the sacred work of God without most earnestly seeking heavenly direction because Christ has said, without me you can do nothing, John 15, 5. And so when we are united in the unity for which Christ prayed, this long controversy that has been kept up through satanic agency will end. And we shall not see men framing plans after the order of the world because they have not spiritual eyesight. 
to discern spiritual things. They now see men as trees walking, and they need the divine touch that they may see as God sees and work as Christ worked. Then will Zion's watchmen unitedly sound the trumpet in clear, louder notes, for they will see the sword coming and realize the danger in which the people of God are placed. Uh, the question that I should ask myself and the question you should ask yourself, as you interact with the people, as you interact with other ministers, do you see them as God will see them or you see them as trees standing? There's a lot of difference in how God views things and the way man views things. And I'm presenting to you the message of righteousness by faith in the Minneapolis uh, 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 a controversy in a way that uh, you may look at it again that the message of righteousness by faith as it is called it was to lay the glory of man in dust so that Christ may be put at his rightful position so that may may not ascend to the thrones and uh, be placed where God should be placed that uh, their glory had to be laid in dust and uh, as you look at the message so deeply it be, goes beyond the proclamation of it and uh, bringing man to a position he will view things the way God views them. Genesis 1.26 says that uh, God made uh, or created man in his own image and likeness, so he created them male and female. Now, that is just as it reads like that. That man had to be in a position that he was the temple of God and the spirit of God dwelt in him so that man may not view things the way man has to view them but the way God views them. And so as the other brethren were viewing Wagner and Jonas, is it the way God would want them to view them? Today as you view men, is it the way the Lord would want you to view them? Is that righteousness by the way? Is, just, is that just? Or how do we look at the whole message? This message of righteousness by faith and justification by faith. It is being just and it is being righteous. And in which way? By having the just and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It means that 1 John 2, 6, that whoever says that he abideth in Christ must walk as he walked. My rese might resemble Jesus Christ in everything, in every import and contact when they are on earth. But the human element has been brought into the work so that uh, the glory of man has not been laid into dust. But uh, the loom of heaven which is uh, uh, sewn uh, or uh, which is woven uh, without any human wand has been destroyed by man putting threads in it so that uh, we now have the loom that is not only Christ loom woven from heaven but uh, the ones of men uh, have been put in it and uh, this has caused the Lord not uh, to respond to the prayers of the church for uh, to be given the latter rain and uh, 1888 page 1000 paragraph 1 and, uh, you know, I have just put this in a snippet of things. You can go and read the whole book. We are amid the perils of the last days, and it makes my heart ache to read the articles in the review that published to the world that we are at variance. So, she says that uh, there are two publishing houses, the review and uh, uh, was it the Pacific Press? Uh, I can't recollect my mind and uh, I am uh, liable to being corrected. And we have Jonas and Wagona running here, a publishing house, and Uriah Smith is running the Review and Herald. And the messages of 1888 are going on. The session, the ministerial, uh, uh, the ministerial institute, and the conference itself, but what is coming from these papers, it is that we are at variance. And uh, here the, the prophet is responding to the things which are happening. 
We are amid the perils of the last days and it makes my heart ache to read the articles in the review that published that published to the world that we are at variance. One feels moved to present the coming conflict in strong lines as he views it. Then our good brother Smith gives the trumpet a counterblast to make of an effect the warnings given in the same issue. Even if he did see that Elder Jones was too fast, what was his work? Go to, the bro to brother Jones, talk with him before his piece was inserted in the review. This will be doing the works of Christ, but to put that article in the paper from Elder Jones and then Elder Smith write, as he has done, an article in the same issue is entirely contrary to the light which the Lord has given me. Better let the articles of Elder Jones remain unpublished than in the face of our enemies and the world which are watching to see something which they can use against believers to present them in an unfavorable light to the world. This, I was shown, should not be done, that there will be alienation and disunion. I do not doubt, for this is the very work Satan is determined shall be, but which cannot be if the professed believers will heed the words of Jesus Christ. Now, just meditate upon that. She says, the world is watching as a people, us as a people, and our enemies are not slow to take advantage of any indication of variance among us. A sister in Australia lately received a letter from her sister in Michigan. Now, it is not just uh, something happening in Minneapolis conference, but now the information is scattering in America, and now it has reached Australia. Let us read on. A sister in Australia lately received a letter from her sister in Michigan, that is USA, that shows the influence of these things. The parents of the girls are not Sabbath keepers, but were becoming somewhat interested in our faith. When the minister of their church informed them that the Adventists were at variance among themselves, some were advocating one position, he said, and some another, in decided opposition to the first. The people could not agree as to what they did believe, and the whole thing would pre prove to be a delusion. And so, you can see the dangers and the spirit of Minneapolis 1888, how now it doesn't just affect the message of uh, justification by faith, and righteousness by faith, but it goes on even to destroy the other messages and the people who are now getting interested in what Seventh-day Adventists believe say that we cannot join such a movement where actually two ministers of the same faith standing on the same desk issues in the same paper things that are contrary to each other. I want us to think about the spirit of Minneapolis. I want us to examine ourselves. What is happening among us? What is happening among us, the leading brethren in our movements, and even in our churches, and even at a personal level? What kind of spirit am I fostering? What kind of spirit are you fostering? And we are told that uh, there needs to be a fresh conversion happening among us. The first thing recorded in scripture history after the fall was the persecution of Abel. And the last thing in scripture prophecy is the persecution against those who refuse to receive the mark of the beast. We should be the last people on the earth to indulge in the slightest degree the spirit of persecution against those who are bearing the message of God to the world. This is the most terrible feature of unchristlikeness that has manifested itself among us since the Minneapolis meeting. Sometime, it will be seen in its true bearing with all the burden of woe that has resulted from it. Now, Sister White is saying that the spirit of Minneapolis, it may not be recognized at that meeting and in the level that the people think, but later on we shall see its fruit. Later on, its pregnancy shall come out. We say sometime it will be seen in its true bearing. And uh, I ask myself, maybe 
the spirit of Minneapolis has not been seen in its true bearing, even today among East Asas people, because things continue as they were. And yet, the thought is that uh, we are doing well and the movement is going strong. But uh, the spirit of Minneapolis has not been seen in its true bearing, even as we speak today. Maybe the Lord will open our eyes again in a new way. What we need as Laodicean is an eye salve so that we may be able to see things in their true bearing. Rather than just professing, we understand. And they did this and they did that. Can we, brethren and sisters, take a back seat and pray that the Lord may bring out the true bearing of the spirit of Minneapolis? And in the minutest degree, the Lord to reveal if it is possessing our hearts even today. Uh, I continue. I have a few slides to go and then we bring this to an end. Not the series, but uh, the presentation. When a new view is presented, the question is often asked, who are its advocates? What is the position of influence of the one who will teach us who have been students of the Bible for many years. So many people have been students of Bible for many years and when the message is coming to them they ask me who is this person presenting this thing? We have been teachers of this thing for many years. In fact, E.G. White herself says that uh, I have been pe preaching the message of righteousness by faith for the last 45 years yet no one was understanding it. Yet Wagona had been given by the Lord, the prophet herself says, a more clear way of presenting that message to the church. And when I heard it from another, the fiber of my whole being said, Amen. Because no one else has been shown this message excepting my conversation with my husband, then it seems that no one understands it. And the prophet herself never understood the message as Wagona and Jonas understood it. That is what we find out yesterday, the interview that Jesh Washburn had with uh, Roberto J. Willand. That Sister White confessed that Wagona understood the message more than she had. She, she understood it. So when the message comes to the church, the same thing that happened then repeats itself. The question is often asked. Who are its advocates? What is the position of influence of the one who will teach us, who have been students of the Bible for many years? Then she says, God will send his words of warning by whom he will send. And the question to be settled is not what person is, is it who brings the message. This does not in any way affect the word spoken. By their fruits you shall know them. To J. H. Kellogg and the wife. This is page 1156, paragraph 2, 1888 messages. She, uh, she tells J. H. that is John Harvey Kellogg uh, and wife. We have every evidence that the Lord is using Elder Jones, Elder Wagoner, and Professor w Prescott. And uh, with this evidence before us, it pains my heart that any of my brothers in the faith should feel impatient and bitter toward them and refuse to draw in cords of love and unity with them. Strife must cease. We must have unity. These representative men must respect one another and work in harmony. You have a most responsible position and the Lord will greatly bless you if you walk in humility before him. But do not, my brother, expect every mind to be constituted like your own. Do not expect that your brethren will see everything in the same light and attach the same importance to some matter that you do, for you will certainly be disappointed. And I ask you, brethren and sisters, why are we being disappointed today? There is an inclination that everyone will be just as we are. And when this doesn't happen, we are disappointed and we start alienating one from another. How I'm praying for a converting spirit. 
and uh, may it first happen with me. I'm not even praying for anyone else. I'm praying for my own soul, that it may start with me, the way uh, I really view things. And then I'll be praying for you, and you'll be praying for me too, that something may happen. To Captain C. L. Ridge, she says, My brother, in your letter you speak of leaving the review office. I am sorry that you can be willing to separate from the work for the reasons you mention. They reveal that you have a much deeper experience to gain than you now have. Your faith is very weak. Other families, much less than yours, sustain themselves without one word of complaint on half the wages you have. We have been over the ground and I know what I am talking about. It is evident that whether you remain in the review or separate from it, you have lessons to learn that will be of the highest interest to you. I do not feel at liberty to urge you to remain, for unless you drink deeper of the fountain of living waters, your service will not be acceptable to God. Brother A.T. Jones, I wish to call your attention to another matter. I was attending a meeting and a larger congregation was present. In my dream, you are presenting the subject of faith and the imputed righteousness of Christ by faith. You repeated several times that works amounted to nothing, that there were no conditions. The matter was presented in that light that I knew minds would be confused and will not receive the correct impression in reference to faith and works. And I decided to write to you, you state this matter too strongly. There are conditions to our receiving justification and sanctification and the righteousness of Christ. Then listen to what the prophet says, I know you are meaning, but you leave a wrong impression upon many minds. And so, in as much as Jonas and Wagona were presenting the message, there was another element that even made the matter so hard that there were some strong points which were being put forth which people would get a wrong impression. And also the messages had to come out in an impression that the Lord will accept them. And so, again, it comes back to the vessels that are being used that uh, would we humble ourselves more enough to be consistent with not only the message that we are given, but even how it will come out. To F. E. Belden, the nephew uh, of uh, James White and Sister White, all who were concerned in the payment of the large wages have been guilty of robbery toward God. Will a man rob God? Yet he have robbed me, said the Lord. And the results have been that God's messengers and workers who are poor in earthly treasure are pressed into hard places. Some have large families, some have a father and a mother to support, and it's a difficult matter to make ends meet. Did these men in the office think of this? They will seek to pacify their conscience by some substitute of their own contrivance, but the books of heaven tell the story. The large wages they accepted for themselves and vindicated the acceptance of others, they no more earned or needed than did some of those whom, by their decisions, were limiting to a certain sum without a word of inquiry as to whether this would cause suffering or not. Is this doing as they would be done by? Is it loving their neighbor as they love themselves? The law of God is a complete standard of righteousness. Man has not in himself sufficient wisdom to frame, to frame a perfect rule of right, and therefore God has given his law as a safeguard. Man is not left to his own fallacious reasoning in regard to his course of action toward his fellow men or his service to God. He is not left to stumble along following the imagination of his own heart and mind. God calls the attention of men to apprehend the rule of action. Commandments that have God for their author, the law pronounced by inspiration, holy, just, and good. The service that God expects of his servant is not left to question and doubt. Will man love God supremely and his neighbors as himself? The Lord will not accept donations to his cause from means gained by the robbing of his treasure. This is not the way to make wrong deeds right. It will not blot out the record from books of heaven. God requires strictly impartially, strict impartiality in deal between man and man. But uh, the wisdom that is far from above is first pure, then uh, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, fully, full of mass and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. 
and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. The eighth commandment is to barricade the soul and age man in so that he shall make no injurious encroachment which his self-love and desire for gain will make on his neighbor's rights. It forbids every species of dishonesty, injustice or fraud, however prevalent, however palliated by plausible pretenses. The ninth commandment requires of us an invi inviolable regard for exact truth in every declaration by which the character of our fellow men may be affected. The tongue which is kept so little under the control of the human agent is to be uh, bridled by strong cons conscientious principles by the law of love toward God and man. And lastly, the last commandment condemns covetousness. Every selfish desire, every degree of discontent, every act of overreaching, every selfish gratification works to the strengthening and developing of a character which will destroy the Christ-like of the human agent and close the gates of the city of God against him. There will be astonishing revelation when the judgment shall sit and the books shall be opened. The revelator, the revelator says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Oh, I wish that men who fill responsible positions in the Review and Herald office would carefully study the history of their works during their connection with the office and let their unfeigned prayers come up before God that his Holy Spirit shall quicken their consciences and memories, for that they might see the evil of practice, the evil of practices utterly opposed to God's holy law, and repent and confess their sins before it shall be forever too late. They are transgressors of the law. He who offends in one point is guilty of all. Now you are just wondering, how did tithe and offerings come in in the message of righteousness by faith in the manuscript there? It reached at a point that uh, men were withholding support of these other brethren. It reached a place that the treasury of God was coming to an empty because men held positions had prejudices, and then now what was being hindered going forth is the work of God by withholding what was rightful to others. And one sin led to another and to another and to another. And remember, these are people who are saying that we are obeying the commandments of God. But now they have reached at a point they wouldn't even support other brethren. Others had reached at a point they cannot work in the office. Others were reaching to a place they had to have increment of the wages. And so many things are happening just because of the spirit that is going on in these meetings. Now we want to know if uh, the Lord is guiding us and leading us. And uh, shall we come out clean? Or uh, shall we come out the offenders? And so, we look back at Minneapolis and we look out how we have treated each other. And we look out even as we have come to a point we can support others whom we have varied with, not only in doctrinal matters but all, also on social issues. And we look at, is the spirit of Minneapolis still pervading the church? And the answer is a resounding yes. What is the solution to this whole matter? The Lord says, you must be born again. He says that uh, if you hear the voice of the Lord today, do not harden your heart as it were in the wilderness with the children of Israel. But uh, we may repent, each one of us, and seek the Lord afresh in this journey that is soon coming to an end. Otherwise, we shall have thought that uh, all the day we were in the side of the Lord, but find ourselves castaways. May the Spirit of the Lord convict each one of us of uh, what is the truth, how shall we present it, how shall we treat others, and at the end of the day, am I being used of the Lord, or am I aligning myself with the beast 
in his image. Shall we pray uh, as we end? Heavenly Father, thanksgiving and praises be unto thy name. We have nothing to do but to allow ourselves fall on the rock and our hearts may be once again be refreshed with the uh, with thy own presence for we are told in Acts 3 that uh, repent ye and be converted so that uh, when the refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord your sins may be blotted out this is the exact condition in the right state we want to be in our sins to be blotted out and the refreshing from the Lord we may be partakers for of uh, the refreshing from the Lord I thank thee Heavenly Father because uh, you make this possible and where human element have come in into your work and man has been placed where God should be that all this may vanish from amidst the movements of this day Help us to learn from our history. This is my prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.